sketch read and then you think god this is a really old guy but uh, I take comfort in the fact looking around that I'm not the really oldest guy in the room and uh, some real legends that I look up to are here tonight as well and I uh, appreciate them being here I was going to make a comment about how many non-traditional students but I think they're really beyond non-traditional students out there so but thanks Natalie I thank you for that introduction and uh, what I hope to do here is uh, review the last 40 years of wilderness fire experience in the Forest Service that started in 1972. Oh. And uh, most of the information I show you will, become, will be from the West Fork Ranger District, but it applies across the Selway Bitter Wilderness. There'll be some others, and also in the Frank Church Wilderness. The West Fork is fortunate to have about 190,000 acres of, of the Frank Church Wilderness and a large portion of the Selway Bitter Wilderness. So both of those wilderness areas are a big part of the Wilderness Fire Program at West Fork. So I couldn't really stop the talk at the Magruder Corridor, especially when the fire wasn't going to stop at the Magruder Corridor. So uh, if you wonder why that's the case, that's why. So I'm 
You know, and I'd like to acknowledge, too, some of the people who aren't here giving the talk. You know, uh, nobody does this alone. I've had a lot of partners through the years. Uh, one of my primary partners is the ranger of Moose Creek, Joe Hudson, who could probably give this talk as well as I do. He's been there since, uh, since 1998, and we have shared a lot of fires back and forth over the years and uh, feel very much simil very similar about it. In fact, I called Joe and I said, I, about some questions, and I know some of you folks know him, and he's a, he's a great supporter of Wilderness Fire as well. Also, the Powell Ranger District on the Clearwater is a big player in wildland fire use. And uh, on the Bitterroot, the, Sel the Darby District and the Seamsville District both have a piece of wildland fire use in the Selway. And I won't even go into the districts on the Frank Church because then I'd probably forget one, so I don't want to do that. So anyway, I was, um, it has been uh, 40 years since then, and for me, at West Fork, it's been, uh, and I always have to do the math, about 16 years. And I'm always reminded that it's, uh, some people ask me, how many times have you done this? And I actually had to, had somebody had to go and add up the wildland fire use fires I've had over 16 years. I couldn't answer that question. It gives a, well, I don't know, that year there was 40, that year was there was 50, but I never added them up. Just didn't, didn't find the time to do that. But there was the first one. There's always the first rodeo. And I remember that um, I was a pretty newbie. I'd never made a fire use decision. It was the first time I got the chance to do a go decision. And in those days, we called them the go, no go decision. If you have a fire start in wilderness, then the appropriate line officer in this region, it is the district, district ranger. It's not the same everywhere. The first uh, fire in 72 was the chief of the forest service. So we've uh, decentralized power a little bit since then. And, uh, but I do remember that first fire, and I'll just share a quick story by way of introduction. As the, uh, I wasn't a new ranger by that time. I'd been seven years a ranger, but my first real chance to do this, flying over the cellway with Chuck Stanich. Some of you may know him. He retired as fire management officer on the Lolo. At that time, he was a, I think he was serving as a fire behavior analyst. He was our assistant fire management officer. We were flying over the cellway and looking at this fire that I'd said go to the day before. And, and he said, well, I think what it's going to do is it's going to continue to fall off the side here, and then it's going to take another run up here, and then it's going to chunk down here, and then it's going to do this for a real technical talk we got into, you know. And they said, it'll probably do that. I said, okay, well, so we watched for the next two, three, four weeks. I can't remember how long it was. And that's what that fire did along with several others. And life went on. Nobody really noticed because it wasn't a huge, huge fire, and every day, People used the wilderness just like they always do. Outfitters served clients. Uh, people rafted the Selway River. And every day, I'd go into the office and revalidate the decision. Is the fire still within meeting its objectives? And in wilderness, the major objective is the wilderness objective of allowing the fire to go. And uh, I relate that story just because that was the first rodeo. And now, some 250 rodeos or 290 rodeos later, uh, you'll forgive me if I can't remit. I should remember. I remember with a bad luck fire was the first fire, of course, but I, I should go back and find out what that very first fire for me was, but I don't remember, to be honest with you. But so with that uh, background, what I'm going to do is go through this 40 years of history, hopefully, and then at the end, I'll try and compile um, a somewhat uh, concise, I hope it's concise, but those of you who know me probably think that's not going to happen. Um, list of some lessons learned, and I brought some material here for you to look at afterwards, some of the references, uh, some of you'll see. So, so let's launch into it. I think we got the, all the, everything fired up. So lessons learned from 40 years, and I think we have to start with the Wilderness Act. And I've highlighted in red there, in contrast to other areas, wilderness is an area untrammeled by man, retaining its primeval character and influence, preserved natural conditions, and affected primarily by the forces of nature. So I would say this is a picture of wilderness that is being untrammeled and primarily affected by the forces of nature. This is a picture from 2000, August 6, 2000, showing several fires. Some of you have been around, were around then. Um, this is uh, taken from over the Selway River. I was in a helicopter looking at several fires. This is the Lonely Fire, which came to be about 17,000 acres by the end. This is the Hamilton Fire which is another 15, 16,000 acre fire. This is Salmon Mountain Lookout right here. And over here, some smoke coming off the Salmon River from the Three Bears Fire, which is actually on the Payette National Forest on the other side of the Salmon River. And then this big smoke, sort of hard to discriminate there, is the Clear Creek Fire on the Salmon Chalice. So you can see we had quite a bit of fire going on in August 6th of 2000. 
and you'll see later. But if you look at this, this doesn't look uncharacteristic in fire behavior in this. This is fire doing what fire does in the wilderness. It didn't look unnatural and it didn't cause us any concern. None of these, none of these fires received any suppression actions in 2000. But this was the same day that if anybody was around on the valley complex that in Sula, it looked like a, a giant mushroom cloud in several places. In fact, I don't have that picture, but I was struck that day because I was looking here and then I looked 40 miles to the east and saw these huge mushroom clouds and it was quite a bit different fire outside the wilderness on the east fork. So a good, and you can never go wrong, I think, and you'll see another one of these by quoting our good friend Aldo Leopold. And this is one measure of a thing's rightness, if you will, in, in uh, just a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, the stability, the beauty of the biotic community. It's wrong when it tends to otherwise. Everybody wants a simple definition of right and wrong. I'm not sure that's so simple, but it does seem to hold, especially in wilderness. And then there's an even shorter uh, quote from Jack Ward Thomas that um, we would be good to learn from the fire's perspective. It's neither good nor bad. It just is. It depends on where it is. And then our good friend and probably the visionary of wilderness fire in the Forest Service, Bud Moore, wrote in 1971, and this is worth taking a minute here, and he's, he's writing the year before. At this time he wrote this, the fire policy had not yet been approved. It's experimental. The Park Service is ahead of the Forest Service at this point. They had what he says, from the first vista overlooking East Moose Creek, we spotted a steep fire burning on a steep slope, started by lightning. That little smoke was an obvious part of the natural scene, an obvious part of the natural scene. So I'd skip down and so, Certain life so that certain life chains may thrive in wilderness, it should burn. This is, this is the director of fire management in Region 1 saying these words. If applied, we let it burn under surveillance. I, but I wonder, I always thought this last paragraph just intrigues me. I, and I, I had the great opportunity to meet Bud and to know Bud a little bit, not as well as some people I know. But uh, he was a great insight. He says, but I wonder if once discovered, if the adrenaline generated in men born of fire suppression would let that fire giving spark give over there on the mountain give life. And sort of wondering, you know, that's something we still wonder about, I suppose. Can we do that? So onward to the next year and the first fire, which was probably improperly named Bad Luck Fire, but it was in Bad Luck Creek. It wasn't that the fire was such bad luck. And uh, Bob Much is here, and afterwards, uh, I'm going to give him time to rebut and correct any mistakes I make along the way. Uh, and I know I can count on him to do that in a very gentle way, um, because I've known Bob for quite a while. But so here's the first and only fire that year that, that was approved in the fire management plan. Two days before this fire, uh, the chief of the Forest Service approved the White Cap plan. Very experimental, controversial, but the chief approved it. Lightning uh, cooperated and there was the bad luck fire and that's about as big as it got. So 72 was a, was a historic year for the first fire, but it wasn't until really later that, the, that uh, things got moving a little more. So here's, I have these maps by the decades and this is the 1970s. So here's the bad luck fire right up here. Just to orient you, Hamilton is up that way. Uh, this is the West Fork of the Bitterroot here. This is the Selway Bitterroot Wilderness north of Magruder this direction, the Frank Church down here, and this green portion is the, is the West Fork Ranger District. We're going down to the Salmon River, and you'll see this in a number of slides. This is this, the lowest point in the Bitterroot Forest on the Salmon River. Um, high frequency, low intensity fire regime there. Higher elevation here, higher elevation along the, the divide with Montana and Idaho. So these are the 1970 fires, and that's it. Those are for that decade on the West Fork. You can see one up here, and I don't know the name of that fire. I should have looked it up, and maybe somebody knows and they can fill me in. But that's on the Bear Moose Creek. Fire, Bear Creek? That's about right. And then the, then, because the, the upper 80s, the upper Bear Creek was in the 80s. So that must be later, right? Okay. Thanks, Bob. So then the, the next year in 1973 was a very interesting year because at that time, if you know the current boundaries of the Selway Bitterroot Wilderness, um, they were, it, in 1964, it didn't go all the way to the Magruder Corridor. It stopped at Whitecap Creek and the, 
White Cap Fire Management Plan didn't allow for fires on both sides of White Cap Creek. This is Fitz Fire on the north side of White Cap Creek in the area. And this is a, a copy of a GIS output from 1973. Uh, and uh, it's, it's state of the art in 1973. Look, there are colored pencils and everything. And uh, so um, I thought it was pretty classic. I'm not making fun of you, Bob. Um, here's the origin of the Fitz Fire. And so it, note down here, it says everything north of White Cap is the Fitz Creek Fire. South of White Cap is the Snake Creek Fire. So the very first year, suddenly, we have a fire that's doing the right thing over here in the wilderness, but damn it, it left the wilderness on the south side. So I think that was the first test of the resolve of this new one-year-old policy. And luckily, the people, that, people uh, in charge there, Orville Daniels, uh, was the forest supervisor at that time, and uh, stayed the course, said, well, we're going to allow the Fitz Creek to burn because it's in the wilderness. We're going to put out the Snake Creek fire. So um, that could be a little hard to explain to some people, especially when they're standing there looking at this fire and this fire. And that was the good fire and the bad fire era. But that's the way it went. And next year, next, uh, year there was a, a nice article in Empire Magazine from 1974, and it's over here on the table. If you want to go over here and look at it after the talk, you're welcome to do that. See how much a, a car cost in 1974. You'll be shocked. Um, and then 30 years later, we had the good fortune to come back and revisit some of these sites. So this is the Snake Creek Fire 30 years later in, 19, in 2002. So then on to the 80s. You can see now, by now, we're starting to get fires in a little few more areas around. This is, uh, again, up in the Bear Creek area in the, in the, in the, um, on the well, that's not Bear Creek. That's probably Brush Fork on the, on the Moose Creek District. Some fires here in the West Fork. And then take a note as you go through this, how many times this burned down here on the Salmon River. And uh, that'll come around in 2012. Uh, you can see some of that again. So the 80s were a big era, but in not so much in the subway, but around the country, there were certainly big, big events, starting, of course, with the 88 Yellowstone fires. Um, some of you may remember the Canyon Creek fire in the scapegoat wilderness where a surfacing jet wind caused that fire to run uh, 30 miles in 16 hours. And uh, the, some of the fires in Bear Creek and the Moose Creek, Joe was telling me, were significant then. And in 1989, the post Yellowstone, all agencies took a time out from natural fire. The direction was, look at all your plans, make sure they're OK. But we didn't stop. This is important. I remember this uh, surfacing jet stream at Canyon Creek is, uh, everybody knows that, that's been around for any time. In fact, in 2000, we had a lot of fire, 300,000 acres on the Bitterroot. And I remember very well sitting on the grass out in front of the cookhouse at West Fork as the fire meteorologist was telling us what was going to happen in the next 12 hours. And he said, there's the potential for a surfacing jet stream somewhere over the fire area. And we're saying, somewhere over the fire area? We got fire from, there's everywhere is the fire area. <laughs> what do you mean somewhere over the fire area? But Immediately, the first thing anybody said is Canyon Creek. So what could happen if that jet stream landed in the wrong place? Fortunately, it didn't land. So it, we didn't have it happen that. But the first thing came out of anybody's mind was the memory of Canyon Creek. So one of the lessons we've, we've tried to learn is we, how do we tell our story? How do we help people understand what this is all about? And so back in the 80s, here's a I think Steve's here and, and uh, Steve McCool, but at the, the backcountry users are showing that they have a, a growing approval of natural fire. Those that get to use it, those that get to see it, those that know what's going on, backcountry users. And at the same time, after the Yellowstone fires, we have President Reagan speaking out against the natural fire policy, and the national media seemed unaware of natural fire. That's from Steve Arno's book, which is over here as well. So. We have backcountry users that seem to understand fire and they're supportive. We have a president, probably seemingly predictably political, saying we don't, we're not sure we like this that much. And the national media doesn't seem to know what we're talking about. So we probably haven't told our story well yet. So on to the 90s and uh, a little wider uh, fire imprint. This is uh, the sweat fire of 96, which burned about uh, 40 acres in about two burning periods from and came out of the wilderness into the upper blue joint which 
interestingly, is out of the wilderness, but into a Montana Wilderness Study Act area, but also one that wasn't in the current plan. So technically, when the fire left the wilderness, it was an escape. But uh, so that leads to a bit of a challenge. And then uh, likewise, the uh, 98, this, this is the Schofield fire coming out and into Montana and a few others here. This is about the, the first years that I was at West Fork. But again, notice we have some fires down here. I think this was called Rainier. Uh, if any of you have been on the Maine Salmon, you know Rainier Rapid, Lance Bar, that, that, that country. So 1990s, those events, led to the federal wildland policy where first wildland fire use was based on the objective of the fire rather than just the origin. In other words, could it be beneficial? Could we say that fire can be used for resource benefit? And in the wilderness, the resource benefit again is the wilderness objective, the wilderness resource, the untrammeled. Um, in um, Dave Cole and, and Laura Young's edited book of Beyond Naturalness, that the, I think the Wilderness Institute had a part in, in publishing, there's a great essay in there by Peter Landers about the challenge of hands off, the challenge of holding your, of, of, uh, I should, I think it was, you know, the dilemma of hands off. I think it might have been. But anyway, the idea of being in wilderness, the real challenge is how not to interfere, how to let that fire start and end naturally, whether it's one acre or 40,000 acres. How do we do that? And how can we help people understand? And then in 98, from the Selway Bitter perspective, that was the first time that year that uh, wilderness fire was also included in the Montana side of the Selway Bit Route, <clears throat> which is a much more difficult part of the wilderness to manage for wildland fire use than the Idaho side because of course we have this nice granite uh, firewall between the Idaho side and the Montana side in most of the areas, not so much in the southern end, but, but in the northern end. So that added another opportunity for challenge, first time since 72. And then uh, 99, I put this in because it was a personal lesson, the Devil Storm Fire. And uh, I say that because in, by this time, my objective is every fire that, is, that starts in wilderness naturally by lightning should be allowed to burn, every one, unless there's a compelling reason not to allow it to burn. So how, and this was a fire in wilderness, Devil Storm Fire, several miles into the wilderness. But early in the season, and as soon as we did a projection on it, it was projected to leave the wilderness and go into the blue joint and then be much closer to values of risk in private land. So we suppressed it. And uh, that was a lesson too, because on that fire, uh, we, did, we didn't take the risk of allowing it to burn. So in instead, we took the risk of suppressing it. And I remember being in a helicopter pulling out a smoke jumper that had burned refueling a chainsaw. He got injured on that fire that we suppressed. That same fire, we had a helicopter that uh, lost its oil pressure and uh, auto-rotated and landed uh, without uh, damage. But so those were, so you might think, well, the, the safe thing to do is to put the fire out. Well, there's another risk there, uh, a different kind of risk. So we don't really do away with it. We just transfer it to another place. So um, an example from that era of the 2000, this is a 98, Schofield fire that is checking the burnt strip fire of 2000. So we're starting to see fires being influenced by many other fires. As longer we get into it, the more history we have. And then 2000, to the 2000 fire season was uh, by that decade was fairly large. See the ones striped here are the fires in 2000 itself. And the reason why they're striped is we didn't count them as wildland fire use fires or prescribed natural fires or wild or uh, fires for resource benefit because at the same time we're having this very big imprint over here and houses were burning as uh, someone said, well, it's really hard to talk about the benefits of fire when on the front page of the Missoulian are people's houses burning. And, and I can tell you it is because I was over here with a CNN news crew trying to do that one day and uh, they wanted to talk about uh, some executive order that had been signed that morning that I had no idea about. So uh, we dodged the whole issue because because I was blissfully ignorant. Again, you can see fires down here, Rainier, Fawn, and this is uh, the picture I showed at the very beginning that shows some of this. This is the Lonely Fire and the Hamilton Fire. There's Sam Mountain Lookout. And this is uh, first fire, Little Blue Fire. This is the first time we evacuated the Upper West Fork that summer. And then there was Razor Fire, the second time we evacuated the 
Upper West Fork that summer. Little Blue was very fond of me because when the Upper West Fork was evacuated, I was a Magruder and I had to evacuate from Magruder and lose my weekend and my wife and I came back. So uh, it's not a good idea to be out of the district when you're evacuating people out of their homes. So that was the plan. So 2000's event, Cerro Grande uh, prescribed fire lit in Bandelier National Monument and eventually burns into Los Alamos, causing another policy review 2001, updated the guide for all five agencies, USDI, uh, Department of Interior agencies, and, as well as the Forest Service. And then in 2002, we're crossing that 30th anniversary mark that I mentioned before, 30th anniversary of the Bad Luck Fire. So those are the events of 2000. And think about how we tell the story. I mean, every time I, I uh, and I've had this opportunity many times with county commissioners and interested people and go and tell them how fire season's going. And uh, I look at that, how many people I'm reaching, and I look, think, how could it be if we could actually get the media to tell our story for us? So let's see if I can't see where the mouse is. Whoop. There we go. OK. Communications? Yeah. So listen, there's a fire in Yellowstone Park. We'll put it out. Technically, I'm not a professional firefighter, though there was a time I wanted to be. When? When I was four. When I was four, I wanted to be a ballerina. Yeah? I don't like to talk about it. There was a dry lightning strike in Lodgepole Pine Forest. The fire spread to 500 acres, but it's all inside a resource benefit zone. Is it under control? Well, as a matter of fact, last night, the park superintendent, in consultation with Bill Horton and several deputies from the Department of the Interior, decided to let it run its course. They're letting it burn? It's not necessarily our policy to put these things out. Putting out fires isn't necessarily our policy? Fire is good for the environment under certain circumstances. Forests have a natural cycle that requires purging burns to reinvigorate growth. Someone just said that to you, right? Yeah. What do we need to do? CJ? Governor of Wyoming's been on TV. Has he mad at us? It's pretty irate. Good irate or? He's irate. All right. Circulate a memo to anyone who's going to see a microphone. The national fire plans based on recommendations from five federal agencies. It clearly states that 80 years of fire suppression hasn't worked. For centuries, wildfires have been a natural part of the evolution of forest ecosystems. When something catches on fire, it's no longer our policy to put it out. That's the kind of thing they shouldn't say. Put that in the memo with a circle and a line through it. Don't you wish somebody would do that for you? But think about that. This is a national television show reaching lots of people, and they got it right. Five federal agencies, 80 years of fire suppression didn't work, natural fire, all that talking points, they got across and they did it right. I was just, when we watched that, I just, I just could, fell on the floor. I thought, I can't believe it. Just amazing. That's why I've... Uh, I never did get the copyright for this, so I hope I'm not going to get it, go to jail because I've used this a number of times. That was in 2001, so right after that, 2000, Sarah Grande, it's in the media, the, pub, the media picks up on it, and they tell our story, and they tell our story pretty well. So a year later, 2002, we had our 30th anniversary, 10 years ago, at Paradise, and we welcome back the folks who were there at the start, the real pioneers of the, of the wilderness fire. So. Bob Much, Bill Worf, Bud Moore, Orville Daniels, Shag Aldrich, and Doris Milner. And uh, as Bob pointed out when we were planning this, we really can't put this off very long, and it's really true, because sadly, uh, Bill Worf is no longer with us, Bud Moore is no longer with us, Doris Milner is no longer with us. So that was a real opportunity, a highlight of my career, to be able to hike nine miles and into uh, Cooper's Flat Cabin and, and listen to the, those folks talk about 30 years ago and have the chance for them to see what had happened in the, pre, in the intervening 30 years from that vision that Bud had that everybody had a part in implementing and then to see really what had happened on the ground. It was a great weekend and, and just, the other, just the other day I came across a letter. It was uh, from Doris Milner written the day after and I don't know if any of you ever got a letter from Doris but they were always a treat if, if they were on typewriter. And they're always little, the, there was, they were interesting because they were little, uh, the O's always had solids in the middle of them. It's a, probably an, a very old typewriter. This was handwritten. But she said in it, just thanks for hosting, and it was a day of celebration. And she really felt that way. So, and, and I think everybody that participated there did. And as a result of that, again, how do we tell our story? 
Thanks to Bob, he'd invited Steve Woodruff from the Missoulian. And about a week later, this editorial appears in the Missoulian. And you can't ask for better headlines than that from a wilderness fire perspective. Wilderness fire blaze trail to safer, healthier forest. And I thought this is a particular, in the summary over there, if you didn't read the whole thing, lessons learned by managing fires as a natural force in wilderness should be applied throughout western forests. Boy, is he ahead, you know, that's where we're going. You know, it's a, that's where, that's the opportunity to learn from the wilderness experience. So, um, this is one of my favorite slides. I'm sure you in the back really, can anybody see that from the back? But I put this up here for perspective, just to give you an idea of what um, I mentioned earlier on that I had that one fire that I went back and revalidated. So in 2005, we had 50 of them. And this is a spreadsheet that shows those 50 fires uh, as, of, as of September 10th, 2005. And uh, you know, not all of them caused a lot of consternation, but there are some that stick out, like the Beaver Jack fire, you'll see some of pictures of that. That was one that merged with another haystack fire. And uh, then there are other fires. And these, some of you may think these, these are not real big numbers, 33,000 acres. Biggest fire here is 8,000 acres coming over from the Nez Perce. So about 35,000 acres total. And uh, it was 50 fires, but as you see down here, there are eight little footnotes here where eight of those fires got consumed by one of those fires, so they became part of that. So it always gets confusing when you count numbers. You say, well, we're, we had 50. Well, that was yesterday. Now we have 49 because this one <laughs> went that way. So it can be uh, uh, kind of uh, confusing to relate to people. So another thing here, we do outline the potential threats here. As you can see under the Beaver Jack fire here, Magruder Ranger Station, the Elk City Road is a, is a resource at risk, a value, a value at risk. Down here, the Reynolds Fire, Gatton Ranch is an inholding on the Idaho, on the uh, Salmon Chalice just over the border. Sweat Lake Cabin is a cabin in the uh, Frank Church on the West Fork District. Horse Heaven is a historic cabin in the um, uh, west of Magruder, uh, west of uh, Salmon Mountain. And uh, in that case, we, we, we wrapped those uh, facilities and tried to allow the fire to do its natural thing. We have a pretty good wrapping crew at West Fork. If anybody needs a cabin wrap, I got the crew for you. Um, but a lot of the fire looked like this. And not like the first show I, shot I showed you of the huge column. A lot of it looks like this. And another challenge in telling our story is that Every time you go out with uh, somebody from the press and they want to see the fire, what they really want to see is something dramatic. And you can search around to find that, that fire. When, if they can find the, the single tree torching or better yet, a running crown fire, that'll, that'll go on the front page. So I'm of the opinion that the public gets a, gets a distorted view of fire, that they see a lot of that and very little of this. And so they, there's a natural tendency to think, well, that's what the fire is all about. So, um, and also in 2005, this is a picture from Hell's Half Lookout and uh, showing the Beaver Jack Fire uh, and the Haystack Fire, Gabe Creek Fire, and Hell's Half Hicker Creek. Now, Haystack, this is early. Haystack is a separate fire from Beaver Jack. At that point, they came together later. And this is a little time lapse that'll give you a perspective on that. I want you to focus right here. That's the Magruder Ranger Station, right in kind of the crotch of that fire. So from a prescribed fire standpoint, that did a really nice job of wrapping around the ranger station. And it's still there, because if it wasn't there, I wouldn't be here. I can guarantee that. Um, it was pretty clear to me that burning down Magruder would be a quick early path to retirement or something else, probably something else. Uh, for another perspective, this is the Selway River going this way. This is Paradise right here, the Wapiti Fire. Another fire that consumed a little of it. Oh, wait, I think I pushed too far. Anyway, one that, uh, that was also an interesting time because we were protecting the Paradise Guard Station and there was an outfitter base camp right next to it, or not right next to it, but fairly close. So, but we wouldn't, we, well, I should say we, actually, I was, was the one who had to go in and tell Jason said, we're not protecting you. You're, you're in a temporary structure here. We're protecting the historic structure not you. If you want something here, you know, this fire is backing down towards you. And, and uh, it was a real interesting conversation. I won't tell you the rest of it. But, but the, the point being, and I told him, I said, but look on the bright side. <laughs> being an optimist or sometimes delusional, 
uh, said, you know, this fire is backing down towards you and, it, and every bit it gets closer to you, you're better off for the future. And that's exactly what happened. It didn't get to him. He didn't lose anything out of it and it turned out all right. Um, but I think that's a pretty good illustration. This fire, these fires, to give you perspective, are right on the Montana-Idaho border at the head of Whitecap Creek, uh, Patsy Ann Falls area. This is the Nez Pierce border over here at the west side of Magruder Corridor. This is on the uh, uh, break over to the Salmon River uh, from the West Fork at the head of the Selway coming up this way. This is Stripe Fire and the Reynolds Fire here. So this was the fire that could have impacted the, the Gatton Ranch over this direction. No, how many times we've had fires that have impacted the Gatton Ranch. So another means, again, to trying to tell the story. During 2005, we had the good fortune to have the, the University of Montana Center for Large, Large Landscape Fire Analysis, the group, come out. And they helped us um, with setting webcams up on a couple of our lookouts. This one from Spot Mountain Lookout, which is about nine miles by trail off, the, off of the uh, Selway River. They put another one at, at uh, Hell's Half Lookout. So we could actually, at the ranger station, look at real-time photography. And better than that, we could let the public look at real-time real um, video footage of what was going on in the wilderness. Again, transparency. Let's let them see what it really looks like, rather than just that media of smoke and flame. So this is from 2005, September 8th. And this is Thursday, and it's at 3.15 in the afternoon. And that's what the fire looked like. So following that, and the two th uh, to more of the edges here, this is the sweat fire from 96, down below in the gray, and this lonely fire being checked by it, and leading the 2000 decade, the 2010 to 12. So this includes last year, and you can see this rather large imprint down here. If anybody was around last year, you probably remember that it was smoky at times. Um, there I am being delusional. See, I just remember it was smoky at times. And uh, a lot of other people say, well, no, it was smoky all summer long. No, no, I remember it was blue sky some of the time. So this is uh, the Mustang fire on the Salmon Chalice National Forest and on the Bitterroot. Uh, for a fair amount of time, this was, uh, fire was over here and we had several fires in the wilderness over in this direction. Again, here's that, that uh, Salmon River uh, country that I've referred to a couple of times. It's been visited by fire. How many times have I pointed to that in the last 40 years? Several times. There's Salmon Mountain Lookout. So this fire eventually consumed uh, these fires along here and then wrapped around and at one point uh, came across here. And this was kind of interesting. It made one run to the, to the north east there and spotted about three miles out ahead of itself. I remember looking at the infrared photography one day and, and it was down here, but there was a spot right up below Hell's Half Acre Lookout. I mean, it was separated by some period of time. So again, falling back to my optimistic or sometimes delusional uh, nature, I said, well, this could work out okay because it's well ahead of the main fire. And maybe that'll just prep that that area to look out for the, when the main fire gets there. We'll see how that happens later. I probably wouldn't be telling you if it was a real bad story, so you probably know. So, and then these are several other fires on the West Fork that were managed under a point protection strategy by that time uh, where we'd evolved to in that fire season. And this fire is the porcupine complex that uh, consumed our salamander fire, which is over here. So again, like those fires, when one fire takes over another one, the larger fire ends up getting the name, so you don't see a salamander there, though it was. Here's the salamander fire about a month before that, August 2nd, and uh, for oh, two or three weeks, and uh, this stayed right on, salamander, on the ridge between Salamander Creek and Flat Creek. Didn't seem to want to move much. As other fires were moving a lot, that one didn't seem to move much. But, uh, and they all have their own his personal history, so this uh, I threw in here because, uh, again, to illustrate the point, this is uh, fire severity from the Mustang complex, which by the time Mustang was done, and, and this is October 9th, which is uh, pretty late for us, um, so I want to point out the amount of red you see is the high severity, the yellow is lower severity, and then mixed severity would be the, the kind of orange color. And here's the wilderness boundary here. This is in the wilderness over here. This is non-wilderness 
Salmon River breaks. So then you can see there's a lot more red over here than there is here. Certainly along the Salmon River where it's been burning continuously for the last uh, 40 years. And there are still trees there. There's still big ponderosa pine there, but it's burned low intensity for a number of years. And then lo and behold, here's that, uh, that fire that came up to Hell's Half. You can see it's low severity up there. So my delusional tendencies are working once again. I'm going to retire before I run out of delusions, I'm sure. But um, another example of trying to share the information from last year is, is uh, the infrared imagery. And some of you, that, did anybody see any of this last year? That this, did you have access to it that, you know, got sent? Okay. There's, it was available to some media outlets, some, I don't know how widely it got shared, but it's a great way. And last year, especially as smoky as it was, there were lots of times we couldn't tell where the fires were unless we had infrared imagery. So this little uh, twin engine plane out of Boise flies over it with infrared sensors in the middle of the night, sometime around four o'clock in the morning. Um, some analyst in Boise puts out this map, sends it to us, and then luckily we can turn around and send that, that map that we'll, un we'll load out onto a Google Earth image to anybody, which was really handy. Uh, I know our outfitters in particular appreciate it. Back over here, um, on the Magruder Corridor in here, we had an outfitter trying to operate at that time. We wanted to know where the fire was. So we just send him the KMZ. He's at his, at his uh, satellite hookup at his base camp, throws it on there, and he knows where the fire is. Again, it's transparency. We, don't, we, want, to, we want to tell people what we know. So this is the, the porcupine complex over here, some fires in the Moose Creek here. This is uh, the several fires on the West Fork, and then this is a ditch fire, I think, on the Moose Creek. And uh, these two, this, this was uh, right on the border of West Fork and Moose Creek. And uh, then Powell Complex, some of you were around here last year, probably saw some of the columns from the Powell Complex. And then late in the year, a sawtooth fire in the, in the Bitterroot. So all these fires are on the other side of the divide, except for sawtooth. I was actually working the fair booth at uh, River Valley County Fair when somebody came up and says, hey, would you come outside and look for a minute? And, I said, what's that? I said, well, that looks like a smoke column. And it was so smoky that actually a resident had called it in and we tried to confirm it, and, you know, just a matter of, of, of getting to it. And, uh, and sure enough, it was there, and it was in a very inaccessible spot. Uh, so the edges are important. To, you know, manage it. one of the themes of this is wilderness on the edge. So whenever a fire reaches the edge of something, whether it's the edge of, the, in this case, the wilderness boundary or the sawtooth fire, which is starts in the wilderness. Here's the origin up here. You can kind of see from the topographic lines there, that's not a place you'd want to be chunking line. Uh, very, very steep, very unsafe to have anybody in there. And this is, uh, so this is a probability, fire spread probability map from, uh, from a fire model that uh, we can also use to share with people. The difficulty here is you have to really be careful about explaining because it it's somebody used to looking at uh, fire spread maps might think, well, this is where the fire is spreading. Well, no, it's not. It's really a, it's really a, a prediction of a probability of how likely the fire is to reach any point on that map. So this red here is an 80 to 100 percent probability that it will reach that size uh, in a 14-day period, this is forecasting out for 14 days usually. They can do them shorter and of course they're more accurate. And then as you get to the, more, to the other colors, you can see there was a 2 to 4.9 percent that have ever reaching out here. So based upon that, you know, you can work with the county sheriff and decide where to evacuate, where not to evacuate. And uh, so that was about when we got evacuated from our house right up here uh, in the 4 percent range. So. Uh, it wasn't really that, that difficult to see, looking at this, how much I needed to worry. And I think here's a good case of how transparent we could be. I had a new neighbor, just moved in. They were terrified because they were told they should evacuate. So when they were told they should evacuate, they figured that their house was toast. They're gone. They just figured it's all is lost. And I said, Jane, it's a 2% probability. And she said, really? That made me feel so much better. So how can we help people not be, help alleviate some of that anxiety just by sharing the information with them? Again, transparency. Some more fires. This is, again, this is uh, October 10th, which is about 
a month after when we usually get a season ender event or something about then, about the beginning of Idaho hunting season, we often count on that end of season. But this is October 10th on the way up to Salmon Mountain. So, Bill, have you been there since then? Okay, well, you can see it, it did stop. I put that in there partly for you. And then, uh, so here again, this is the kind of fire activity, October 10th of uh, 2012. And you can see it's on the ground consuming these large thousand hour fuels on the ground, but not in the crown. I think uh, some of the folks in the audience here were that day because they were unwrapping the Salmon Mountain Lookout. Because by that time, it's time to get the wrap off. The fire main thread had passed. And uh, it's better to do it now than later when it's snowing. But again, this is October 10th. And, or, and oftentimes we'd be doing the September 10th. So last year was a fire season that started early and lasted a long time. And here's my great prediction of uh, Hell's Half pre-treatment. You see that uh, here's the, the furthest extent of the Mustang complex by the time it came around. And this is right below Hell's Half Lookout. Again, it burned just in the gr on the ground there, spotted out ahead of itself. And then to put it in perspective, by the time the, the uh, Fire, the, the sawtooth fire had come around. We were then picking up fires from Wenatchee Complex over here, Cascade. These are in the Cascade Mountains over here. The sheep fire down near Riggins. The 340,000 acre uh, Mustang Complex. The, I can't remember how big Halstead came out. It was a couple hundred thousand down near Sun Valley. So, but this is a good illustration to where the smoke moves from southwest to northeast. And uh, if you think of it, I always think of it as like an eddy in a river. The, how, the, how the water pools in behind the, the rock in a, in a river. The Bitter Mountain Range is a big, we're in a big eddy here that sometimes that smoke just ends up and pulls in to the Bitter Valley. I um, use that analogy with a number of county commissioners and it never seems to satisfy them for some reason. I don't know why. I'm going to have to polish that presentation a little more, I guess. So um, I'll spend just a few minutes on this. This is out of our Wildland Fire Guidebook and the Wildland Fire Use Guidebook and how um, we go about assessing risk on fires. And so this is uh, um, three different charts here that add up to the summarized on this chart. So these are values at risk, whether they're natural or cultural or resource concerns. This is inside or outside of wilderness. This could be used. How close is the fire to the value? Uh, how big are the concerns? Then the hazard. How far out of whack fire regime condition class? How far out of natural condition is the area where the fire's in. The current fire behavior, is it just smoldering on the ground or is it already a crown fire? And what's the potential for the fire in size? And then the probability is, is there a barrier to fire spread? So again, I've already mentioned the Bitterroot Mountain Range is a pretty good barrier to fire spreading into Hamilton and the Bitterroot Valley from our side, uh, but in not the same case in every place. And then is it, what time of season is it? Is it early? which means there's a lot of fire season left, and uh, that adds to your risk. And what's the seasonal severity? Is this a more severe than usual season? This, this, so uh, you add all those together, and you come up with a rating from each of those, put them in here, and that ends up with a kind of an estimate of what your risk is in, in allowing that fire to burn. So I use that, and, and I've done this talk for a, 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 a advanced fire practitioners for a number of years, and I always like to throw in something for the line officers that get to make the decision, which is I, I renamed uh, this, I used it line officer accountability. So um, it's the same idea, but over here instead we have uh, four different characteristics. So it's uh, your personal experience with fire use, your comfort of how, comfort how comfortable are you with uncertainty, what's your professional liability insurance limits, and then what's your proximity to retirement. Um, now, I bat four for four on that, so I'm over here. But I, I don't presume that everybody does. There are some people that have a lot longer to retirement. Um, and then over here, what's the public's acceptance and support for wildland fire use? And down here, what's the support and understanding of your supervisor? You might be real comfortable, but if your supervisor's not, or somewhere up the line you don't have support, that may, that may increase the, um, the risk over here. And then the relative risk rating from, rating from the guidebook. I don't think anybody's ever really filled this out, but it's just an illustration. So let's see what's happening back in our, 
if I can get it right here, that the, the rest of the story. Has the fire abated at all? Not yet. How far has it spread? 6,500 acres. So it's starting to close in on the boundary. Yes, sir, Mr. President. It's not too late to reverse your decision. Do you think he should? No. Why? There's a cold front moving down in from Alberta with a 50% chance of showers. Temperatures in the area have already started to drop. And if the rain reaches Yellowstone by tonight, it'll be enough to quell the fire. And if it doesn't, we put it out and the president looks like an idiot for waiting this long. Yeah, but we're going to make sure he looks like an idiot too, right? Yeah. Wyoming's just going to have to have some faith that the Department of the Interior knows what it's doing. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. President. I would say that's like an outtake from Fantasy Island. Wyoming? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'll be the day. <laughs> but it's interesting, you know, like here's the President and the Secretary of Interior making a decision on, by this time it's a 5,500 acre fire. You know, it's a, but that's still a lot of what they said, you know, reaches the masses. We should be really grateful for somebody taking the time to get it as right as they do. So from the last year or two, uh, we had the opportunity, Stephen Pine, some of you may know, is a historian out of Arizona State. He's under contract with the Forest Service to write a history of fire for the Forest Service. And uh, we hatched a plan over the 40 year anniversary that we wanted to fly back over the area with Steve, with Bob. So Bob, Steve, and myself, got in a plane and flew over the over the uh, Selway Bitterroot and part of the Frank Church and, and then he wrote in his little blog and you can find it if you if you uh, Google Fires Call of the Wild, Steve Pine, says if Americans had a national registry register of historic places for fire, the Selway Bitterroot region would rank among the early entries. I think that's probably pretty accurate. And then on the uh, White Cap project, the brainchild of Bud, Bud Moore, you know, down here, this is from uh, an article by University of Montana professors Casey Teske, Carl C. Stanton, Lloyd Queen concluded in the study of satellite maps. This is the Frank Church, Selway Bitter and the Bob Marshall, that past fires were regulating the size of new fires, confirming that many witnesses had observed over the years, which I always say my job kept getting easier and easier and easier. Probably a trained monkey could do it by now. Um, and this is an example. You know, this is from that July 2nd flight. This is the 2011 Hell's Half Fire running into the Devil Storm Fire of 1999. And so, just to review, here's a few, uh, I'm going to go through those charts pretty fast and then some lessons. 1970s, a little bit of fire. 1980s, a little bit more. 1990s, a couple large fires. 2000, even more, starting to fill in. And then 2010, we had the Mustang Complex. And then if you add them up from 1970 to now, you can see a lot of patches over here. And the size of these patches versus the size of this patch is illustrative. All those fires largely are being influenced by past fires, self-regulating. And this map is up on the wall, but this just goes you fire history from 1989. Uh, actually, this one is from 1870. But, but you can see, again, the size of the patches here and the, versus this patch, if you want to call it that, and versus here's a 2000 fire here, here's a 2000 fire here. Same fire year over here, same fire year here. But here we'd had 40 years of, by that time, or by that time we'd had 30 years of uh, fire and fire use in the Selway Bitter. So what lessons, I'm going to try and hope I'm not running too long. I haven't seen anybody fall asleep yet, but I haven't been paying that close attention. But um, So some of the questions we ask ourselves, you know, historic structures. Have we talked with the state historic preservation officer? Have we had consultation with tribal governments if they're involved? And we know what structures will be protected and how. And what's the agreement between units? We've had some difficulties with that at times. And then, uh, the, so example of historic structure, here's the Magruder Ranger Station being protected during the 2005 Beaver Jack fire. I don't think we ever really fired up the, the hoses on here, the fire state on the other side of the cellway did a really nice job. And then another lesson learned, access. Again, back to transparency or access, I would say let them in. If at all possible, demystify the fire. I've had this discussion with many fire teams over the years and oftentimes they want to draw a line around it because it's a fire after all, we want to keep people away. And I'm always on the other side, no, let them in so they can see what's going on unless there's a reason that they can't be there. A quick story, and the, 
outfitters and non-outfitting public the same, and again, you have to work with the fire team. We find that when people go and actually witness the fire, they have a much better understanding and oftentimes are very supportive of it. Sometimes it's one of the wildest experiences they get in the wilderness. They really get to see the untrammeled wilderness. Um, so through the years, we've had a few um, horse wrecks, you might say. We've been bucked off a few times, but uh, it's worth thinking about how we came through each of them. You know, the very first one, it says 73, 1973, one year into it, the Fitz fire crosses out of the area into Snake Creek. So that could have been a death knell for the program, some thought. Didn't. Continued. The 88 Yellowstone fires, obviously national media, caused a critical look at all the plans and a cautious restart, but we restarted. 2,000 fires on the Bitterroot and the Salmon Chalice, the Salmon Chalice. The second year, the four supervisors there said, 2001, I don't want any fire use fires. Now that caused me a little heartburn. I won't, it, I'll have an aside conversation. You can tell you all about that some other time. Um, well, I, I should explain that because that just leaves it. Because when, when that happened, all the fires, we had, I think, 17 fires on the West Fork that year. We put out one fire, and that was the fire that was projected to go to the salmon. Never would have put it out, except it was projected to go to the salmon. The salmon said they didn't want it. So we put that fire out. And driving to work one day, I hear on NPR somebody blasting the West Fork of the Bitterroot National Forest for dropping 16 smoke jumpers and spending $17,000 for a fire in the middle of the Frank Church wilderness. Uh, I gripped the steering wheel a little harder when I heard that. I was just a little bit disappointed. And then uh, 2012, the last year, you know, we had a predicted extreme fire year, forecast a shortage of fire funds. Does anybody know there's a, there seems to be a financial thing going on in the U.S. government these days. So that was a big thing. How are we, do, how are we gonna manage this with the fire funds? How are we gonna do that? And it's an election year. So we, we didn't have the same support for fire use this last year as we did. So we got bucked off again. But 2013, we're ready to get back on. So lessons, some of the other lessons. The edges, edges do matter. As, again, I was trying to come back to that theme. Sometimes it's that edge of that comfort zone. It's, it's, if it's your first time, it can be a little uncomfortable. Uh, I know a lot of people ask me, how in the world did you go home and go to bed when you have 50 fires on your district <laughs> that are burning? And uh, I said, really, I sleep pretty well. Now, because by that time I'd seen a lot of them, I knew they were all doing what they were supposed to be doing. I lost a lot more sleep this last summer than I did those summers. Um, and then the edge of the administrative boundary, whether it's gonna go on to state land or some other private land, that's a big problem. Then the edge of the com your comfort zone with risk or exposure, do you transfer that risk to the, to the hill attack, to the smoke jumpers, to the air tanker, or do you put the fire out and then postpone that risk of that fire to a future generation? And then with partners, again, I've mentioned outfitters, they can be supportive, but they need access. They need to be able to access their, their livelihood, which is the wilderness in some cases here. Regulatory agencies, Fish and Wildlife Service, National Marine Fisheries Service, they're far more concerned about the suppression effects than the fire effects, generally. State agencies, the Fido Fish and Game has been supported from the start because they know that's what produced those big elk populations. But we recognize there's a different role for state lands. You can't expect state lands to look at it the same way as federal lands where they're under a different management objective. And smoke can become political. I put that in there because there have been a few times when the smoke just became to the point where I think the political will was we had to say we can't take it anymore. So by that time, you're not going to put them out, but we're not going to take it anymore. So it's, it's almost a, um, a political decision that, that doesn't have a lot of ramification except that you end up not having some opportunities, perhaps not with prescribed fire. So um, look into the future, and I'm looking at people out there a lot of you way younger than I am, thankfully. And some of these challenges, I think, are ones you will have an opportunity to address. So how are we going to get better at telling the story of wilderness as a self-regulating system? How do we get better at telling that story? It's been a long time to 2001 and, and the West Wing. And uh, I don't know of another time that we've done, gotten that wide an audience. How do we continue to connect people to wildness? How do we get them to appreciate that? That's to me, is. Well, one of the hearts of the question, you know, because that's where we find uh, the real incentive for doing what we're doing, what we're trying to do in managing wilderness fire. And then here's a real challenge. Uh, 
I'm aware as a bureaucrat of some 37 years that uh, we're not nimble as a, as, a, as a bureaucracies don't really dance very well and we don't adapt very well. So how do we get more adept with changing media? We're starting to understand how to use Twitter, Facebook, and whatever the next big thing is. I have no idea what it'll be. Climate change, how are we going to manage that? I, su I suspect that the Selway Bitterroot is better set up for a change in climate than many places where, we've, where we haven't had natural fire. And then uh, where do we find that inspiration for taking the right risk at the right time? I, I wonder, I look back at uh, with some appreciation and uh, might even say awe to those folks in 72, to Orville and Bob and Bud and all of them and say now, this was not the standard then. I've, I've uh, had the opportunity to grab that baton and carry it for a while, but I didn't start the race. Somebody else did those first um, many laps. They were much harder. So where do you find that inspiration to take that right risk? So thinking of that and thinking of fire and thinking of where we've been in 40 years, I think this is a fitting uh, quote to end on. And I think this is many of you, I'm sure, have read all the Leopold's Thinking Like a Mountain about the wolves and deer in, in Arizona. But I draw your attention just the last part of this about how we strive for, for safety, the cowman with trap and poison, the statesman with pen, most of us with machines votes. But at the end of that, it says, a measure of success, and this is all well enough, and perhaps a requisite to objective thinking. But, this is the important part, but too much safety seems to yield only danger in the long run. For many, many years, what people wanted is safety. They don't want it to change. Put the fire out. We want the safety, and we could do that. We provided it. The public will was there. That's what they wanted. But have we really yielded only danger in the long run through that policy? So just a couple references here. And thankfully, I'm about done. Uh, of course, all the Leopold. And then uh, this is a, I've got some of these copies over here. This uh, Lessons Learned from Managing Naturally Ignited Fire by Gary Cohns and Paul Keller is a pretty good summary of the of fire history in uh, Naturally Ignited Fire and Stephen Pines uh, the blog I mentioned, Fire is Called the Wild, Year of the Fires, Steve Arno, Flames in the Forest, and then Beyond Naturalness. And I have to acknowledge uh, the University of Montana, the Wilderness Institute, and Bob Much. Bob's my good friend and pioneer over here. Uh, I find a lot of inspiration. <laughs> and Abby, Abby Kirkledy is our GIS person at West Fork who uh, every time and say, no, I don't want the map quite like that. Could you do it this way? And she kept doing it over and over again and never really got mad at me. And then, of course, all the pioneers, Bud, Bob, Bill, Shag, Orville, and Doris. So I'd like to end on that. This is the Boulder Creek on the West Fork Wilderness Fire several years ago. And it's just a picture that I really like because that fire is just doing what it's supposed to do, as Bud said, in 1971. As it burns, it should burn. And it did. So with that, I'm, I hope I didn't overrun too long, but I'd be happy to answer questions and uh, however you would like to do that. Or if you want to run to the exit, here's your opportunity. Uh-oh. Thanks, Chris. Um, you mentioned a lot about how we get the story out and the, the progress that's been made over the decades of getting the story out about the use of fire and wilderness. And uh, uh, last month, I, this white paper from the Wilderness Society showed up in my inbox about managing wildfires in the wilderness. It's two pages long. There isn't a word in the entire thing about fire use. It's all about suppression and, um, and prescribed fire. Fire discretion, fire suppression, prescribed fire regularly practiced in wilderness areas. Anything you can do inside, outside wilderness, you can do inside wilderness. Um, wilderness designation has limited effect on fire management. It seems to be directly undercutting what you and Bob and others have spent decades trying to get people to understand. How, how, how do we, uh, how do we deal with this from the Wilderness Society? Well, I think, I, I, you know, and as you know, you just handed it to me to this just before we got up here, so I haven't really digested it yet, but I think that they're probably talking about what happened last year and perhaps challenging, I would take it as a challenge to get back on the horse 
you know, I think this is true, you know, that, you know, we did suppress, put into suppression categories almost all the fires in wilderness last year in the national forest system. It's actually, that presents that as actually a good thing, that, that the Forest Service can continue to suppress the wall fires. It's very, uh, this, this is not challenging us to go back. This is, the way fire should be managed in wilderness is through suppression and prescribed fire. From the wilderness This is just one of, of apparently, a series of white papers they're doing. Well, I think they'd find some opposition to that point of view, for certain. I would provide some of that. <laughs> I, don't know. I, I read that two-page brief as them pointing out and dispelling the myth that fires are not touched in wilderness. And the reality is that most fires are suppressed in wilderness and that the West Fork story is actually not the common example across the United States. Well, I'm glad. I read that as they were just trying to say, hey, um, you know, retardant is dropped, line is cut, and basically whatever a manager approves can be done in wilderness the same as it is outside of wilderness. And it can be. You're right, Carol. And and I think that I think you're right. It maybe was that challenge, but and and she's absolutely correct because. Most, many wildernesses don't have the benefits that the celery bitter does of size, of location, of history. So I think that's one of the future challenges too is those wildernesses that haven't had an active fire while in wilderness fire program, how can they have one now in this current? Again, back to uh, that last week. Where do you find that inspiration for that moment? I'd say there's an opportunity right now, um, for instance, in a wilderness that's been completely surrounded by fire this last year. I know of one on my old ranger district in Colorado, the Cache Laputa Wilderness, the High Park Fire, completely surrounded that wilderness. So if I were there now, I'd think this might be the opportunity. We've just had a, pre we've pretty much pre-treated everything around it. This might be an opportunity to take a hard look. And that's a difficult wilderness. And I don't mean to say this is an easy decision. It's far from that. Because <laughs> close to population, you'd have to sell the story. You know, it's right there. You can see it. It's a small wilderness. One advantage it has is it's low elevation, so it wouldn't be a high intensity fire regime. So there's some of that. But again, you've got to find that inspiration and that will to make that first step. And you look at the Welcome Creek wilderness, how small that is, the Rattlesnake wilderness, how close that is. These are small wildernesses, far greater challenge. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't want anybody to go away and say, those wildernesses that haven't been able to do this are somehow lacking in willpower or lacking in desire. They may just, they they're have a lot tougher uh, situation to manage than we have. Like the sawtooth fire, if every one of our wildernesses have been, every one of our wilderness fires have been like the sawtooth fire, right and visible, visible from the town with the potential to threaten the town, they will be evacuating people from their homes, much more difficult. Like I said, I've got the easy job, so I, my hat's off to those people with the harder ones. Steve. Hi, Dave. Uh, what do we know about the use of fire in the Selway Bitterroot by Native Americans? Oh, thanks for bringing that up. Um, lots of, there's, there's a lot of uh, evidence of use of fire in the, by Native Americans. One of the books I didn't, I would recommend too, is a book called 1491, if anybody's seen it by Charles Mann. He, um, I read that just recently, and, and there's a lot of evidence about fire all over the country that in areas we wouldn't even thought, wouldn't have thought so much of, of uh, uh, burning by, by Native Americans uh, way before we ever showed up on the screen, we being European Americans. So routinely the, they burn to clear paths for crossing the mountains. They burn uh, for lots of reasons, so. And probably they, they did like we're doing, uh, allow lightning strikes to do their thing. Pardon me? They, I would assume that they allow lightning strikes to do their thing. Yeah, I would assume they didn't have much in the way of fire suppression activities back then. Probably no Nomex. Sure. Yeah. And so uh, one of the things you indicated was uh, support of outfit. And it strikes me that it's 
a real challenge when you have a big fire year in wilderness and succeeding spring when the outfitters need to get back in business. The trails are usually uh, pretty well, uh, a lot of a lot of down timber, and now you've got cross cuts. And some years you might not even be able to bring your seasonals back. Uh, how do you deal with that? Well. Um we try to give them as much access as we can during the fire. Uh, we try to uh, uh, help get those trails open that are most important to them. During the fire, we move outfitters from one place to another. So if, uh, for instance, one outfitter is uh, in an area that's heavily impacted by a fire right now, we can overlap with another outfitter and allow them to work some other place. Uh, during this last fire year, we worked really hard to keep as much of the wilderness open as long as possible so those outfitters could access the wilderness. And lots of times they gave their clients the opportunity, said, you know, it's really smoky and you may not want to come. And they'd come anyway and then they'd think it's too smoky. Or in one case, uh, uh, I'll give you an example from one of my outfitters, Tom Henderson. I was in his camp at Kim Creek Saddle this October and, and he had, uh, he'd been at the leading edge of the Salamander Fire. It was still open. People could go in there. And uh, he had a client. And they were telling me the story. He said, yeah, this, this client, and you can imagine if any of you were elk hunters, you could see this big six-point bull, and he was bugling, and they're bugling back. And the only problem was these, fire, these uh, trees were kind of exploding from the fire here and there <laughs> around as they're doing this, you know. So uh, they were getting a real wilderness experience with a bonus there. And finally, Tom said, you know, we just got to get out of here. He just, in, I don't care if he's bugling or not, we're out of here. So they left, and about a month later, the guy came back and shot another. He, he, he actually did fill his tag. And I remember sitting in Tom's tent and I, I asked the guy, I said, so, and Tom said, this is the guy, he told me the story. This is, so I said, so what do you think about that? Here you are in a wilderness where it's so wild that there are wolves roaming in the wilderness. There's wildfire roaming in the wilderness. And you're out there hunting in the wilderness. It's pretty wild. And he said, yeah, it's pretty wild. <laughs> so. He was a happy, well, of course he had shot a six point bull, that's probably part of it. <laughs> so it may not be the best, the best sample, but I mean, you just have to work really careful and try to understand how to provide them the best access they can. And some do a better job than others. We've been very, very fortunate that our outfitters understand. Bob. I guess I just have to say this because I know I lost sleep last summer and and I know friends of mine lost sleep last summer. A one Forest Service retiree friend who had been a forest supervisor and a fire director in this region finally wrote a letter to the Washington office with his concern because last year, surprisingly, in the 40th anniversary of wilderness fire in the Selway, the Forest Service chose to issue a fire ban on May 25th last year, essentially saying that all fires that start should be suppressed, including those in wilderness. And suddenly parachutes were observed dropping on the fires in places like the Bob Marshall Wilderness. And as we just heard from Dave, uh, those fires have become self-regulated. And I think it's um, easy to point fingers, and I don't think that's very productive. And I simply would sum this issue up, this move last year, May 25th, going back all the way to 1935, when the Forest Service enacted the nature rigid 10 a.m. policy that any fire that started should be put out before 10 a.m. the next day. That's essentially where we went to last year. And it's also of note that the first supervisor in Missoula, Montana in 1910 was Ellers Koch. Many of you know that name. He was a, a, a sterling Forest Service representative. He not only was present and active in the 1910 fires that burned on the Lolo, he was active in 1919, 1929, and 1934 when fires burned 250,000 acres in the Selway. And he proposed the next year, in 1935, that the Forest Service was getting hammered by fires in the Selway country. And the more we did, the worse it got. 
and he proposed that we allow fires to burn in the Selway country way back in 1935. And as you can imagine in that era, his peers in the Forest Service were horrified and they underscored their horror by enacting the 10 a.m. policy the very year that he proposed fires in the Selway. And to make a long story short, it's not very uh, positive to point fingers, and especially to the students in this room, I would suggest that you include yourselves in the fire community, in the wilderness community, because my thesis is this, that we in the fire community have failed to frame our story in a way that policymakers, politicians, the public, and OMB get it. In other words, if we would do a better job of framing the story, I mean, the story like Dave told needs to be like he said on West Wing or some huge uh, outcome across the country. But that's not true either. Each and every one of us who has an interest in fire and wilderness have a responsibility to frame this story in a way that others get it. And I'm just going to close by saying that I hope you saw an article in Missoulian in January of this year that caught my attention and I did a little work with Google and other sources to learn more about it. But it was the University of Montana dance troupe called Co-Motion that went into the C.S. Porter Middle School in Missoula, Montana and they told a fire ecology story for these children, young boys and girls, approaching their minds through the right side of their brain that's intuitive and creative, not the left side, with facts and figures. And I say that we need more of that. We also had a journalism professor on this campus quoted in January. She had conducted a workshop. How can scientists be more effective in conveying their science to the public? And it was well attended, and her comment about how some of the scientists involved in this workshop uh, engaged themselves in trying to do better, and trying to simplify, trying to tell their story. And, and I would just, I hope it appears on some of your comments for your class that you pick up the challenge and maybe lay out a framework for how this story can be better told so we're not waking up in a anniversary uh, 10, 50, uh, what was it, 2012 to 2022. 2022 will be the 50th anniversary of Wilderness Fire. Let's, let's all do our work so that we're not regressing to the 10 a.m. policy in 2022. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, Bob. You know, I, Bob and I have had a lot of conversations over the summer, and, and I have to think there, I told him this, that there are many times that I thought, what would Bud do, you know? That was sort of my touchstone. I thought, damn it, why can't we be more like Bud? <laughs> why can't I be more like Bud? And he was so inspiring, and so, and that was the inspiration behind that. That's why I put that last, where are we going to find the inspiration to make those big decisions? Where are we going to find that to get back on the horse? And I think this year, that'll be the challenge. And, and we, can we do that? And I, th I, th I believe we can. Uh, and I don't think I'm being delusional at this point. Um, though my wife will probably tell me later. She's a better judge of that than I am. But I think we can if we like the 73 snake escape, like Yellowstone, like those others. We say, OK, that was a temporary thing. We're going to figure out the right. We know what's right. We're going to work on that. and and do what's right, and tell our story at the same time. And that's a challenge. I hope some of you will help us tell that story. Sure.